Good morning. And welcome to Chapel Hill United Methodist Church Online, where our mission is still making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. If you're joining us this morning, uh, there are a number of different ways that you're on there, so not all of this is the same. But uh, on the YouTube link, if you'll click below the, uh, the video at the More Info box, you'll be able to see the liturgy, the lyrics to our songs, the scripture readings, uh, and follow us uh, along that way. Also, if you're looking to give, you can uh, find a link for giving below as well. Also, you can go to our website, mychapelhill.org backslash give, and see other giving options. In fact, we've just now enabled text to give. So if you're looking for uh, information on how to do that, you can find that at the website and uh, give in a new and different way. One big announcement before we get started uh, in worship this morning, and that's Wednesday we are having a prayer service, an old-fashioned prayer service, and we'll be doing that for the next few weeks on Wednesdays at 8 o'clock. You can click the same link you clicked to get here, live.mychapelhill.org, or find it on the other streaming options uh, as well. Uh, We will be lifting up community prayers. We'll be praying about discernment on uh, all sorts of issues, especially uh, affecting uh, our response to uh, the virus and other things. So uh, please come to that uh, in, in a digital way. We have also made it possible for you to interact and lift up your prayer concerns and to be praying with us. So please uh, check that out. It'll be at live.mychapelhill.org Wednesday at 8 o'clock. Also, if you visit our website, you'll see all sorts of new opportunities are springing up for discipleship, and uh, most of those classes will meet via Zoom. Another one is coming on that will start not this Tuesday, but next Tuesday, uh, and Shelley Lott will be teaching that one uh, about St. Mark's Basilica. It will be a really interesting class, and so I encourage you to check it out. We also have a new disciple class that starts on Tuesday, so please be there for that. So I believe those are all of our announcements. Those having been said, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, as we come together in this different way, we pray that you would remind us that your spirit is with us, that you are present in each one of our lives and every one of our situations, that you are speaking to us even when we think we are alone, that you are speaking to us even when we're in a crowd, that your voice has not diminished, but that you are still speaking, and that you haven't given up on us, and that you won't give up on us. Help us to remember those things as we go to worship you now. That we are not worshiping alone, but that you are present with us. That we are not worshiping alone, but through your spirit, we are worshiping with a whole cloud of witnesses, a whole group of other believers. Draw us close to you this morning, Lord Jesus. Help us to be molded and transformed Help our words that we speak and the liturgies that we recite and the prayers that we pray and the songs that we sing and the sermon that we hear and respond to. Help all of those things, Lord, be done to your glory so that the hurting and the broken and the lost would be transformed by you and the people that have hope and people that know their Savior is with them and people that are made whole and aren't broken anymore. We ask all these things in your name, Lord Jesus, remembering the cross and the empty tomb. And it's in your name we pray. Everyone said, amen. Let's worship. Please join with me as we call ourselves to worship. God is speaking. We are are here here to to listen listen for for God's God's voice. voice. God is moving. We are are here here to watch watch where where God goes. God is leading. We are are here here to follow where where God God leads. God is the true shepherd and leads us into life. Lead Lead on, on, good shepherd. shepherd. We We will will follow follow wherever wherever you go. go.
So we come broken to God, who sees us in our brokenness and knows us for who we are and yet still loves us and offers us transformation. Part of that transformation comes about as we confess to God how broken we are. So we confess to God that we are in need, that we are sinners, that we do not have it all figured out. So please join me in this confession and pardon. Merciful God, we confess confess that we have have sinned sinned against against you in thought, word, and deed. By By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.
reading from the book of John. Very truly, I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way, is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. The word of God for the people of God. We now bring the needs of the church and the world and all in need to God's love and care and prayer. This is a responsive prayer, and I'd remind you that your response is, when I pray, Lord, in your mercy, you simply respond with, hear our prayers. Please bow with me now for a time of prayer. Almighty God of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ, you promise to hear us, and we pray in your name. Confident in your love and mercy, we now offer our prayers before you as we lay our hearts before you. We pray for our world, national and local leaders, that they would give them, that you would give them wisdom to make decisions that will bring life to the people they lead and serve. Please speak to them, Lord, through your Holy Spirit and help them to have hearts and minds open to hear your voice above all the others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray that you would overthrow evil powers, right what is wrong, feed and satisfy those who are thirsty for justice, so that all your children may freely enjoy the earth that you have created. Renew our nation in the ways of justice and peace, Guide those who make and administer our laws to build a society based on trust and respect. Help us become people who do good, not because we are told to, but because we love one another and we love our neighbors as ourselves. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Hear the cries of the world's hungry and suffering, Give comfort where there is none and hope where there is despair. Empower your church to be a beacon of light wherever there is darkness. Empower the universal church's worship in this morning and unite all of our hearts in worshiping throughout this world, this country, and this community. Make us one as you are one and remind us that we are not alone. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray you would strengthen our congregation and empower us to fulfill the mission of creating disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world, even now in this season, that you'd empower us even more boldly to share that good news through love. As we reach across to one another, not physically, but spiritually, Lord, and through all forms of communication. May we be strengthened and empowered to fulfill your mission, your great commission. Fill our hearts with your self-giving love, that our voices may speak of your praise and our lives may conform to the image of your Son and our Savior, Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now we raise up silently our personal prayers knowing that you hear us. Lord, 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our, our prayer. prayer. We are ever so much. We are ever so mindful of those who are suffering and those who are hurting. And we're ever so mindful of those who are on the front lines, those who are caring for people who are hurting and ill in hospitals and care facilities, those who are doing all sorts of things that put them in harm's way as essential workers. We pray for all of those, Lord, to have your strength and protection about them. And we give thanks for the calling upon our lives to be your disciples in this season and in all seasons. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. second scripture reading this morning comes from the Acts of the Apostles, the second chapter, verses 42 through 47. Hear these words. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. All came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as many as had need. Day by day, they spent much time together in the temple. They broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to the number those who were being saved. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Let's pray. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak through me. That I would get out of the way and be just a channel for that Spirit to speak into people's lives. Let these words not just be my words, but your words as well. Amen. So have you ever met somebody who was kind of different? I mean, usually when I ask that question, people are like, yeah, you're really weird. Of course, I've met somebody that's kind of different. But I mean, like, other kinds of people (laughs) that are different. Now, I need to be really clear. Normally, I celebrate differences, I love people of all racial and cultural backgrounds, okay? So I wanted you to be really clear up front. Being different is not a bad thing most of the time. Most of the time. But not everybody's the same as me, and that's a good thing. But that being said, there are some things people do or say or believe that is so different that it sticks out right? Um, I'm thinking particularly of one situation that I was in a couple of years ago. I was working at another church as the youth minister. Um, Sometimes as a staff, we would go out to to lunch together. (laughs) Old times. Sounds good, doesn't it? We went to a Mexican food restaurant, and we were sitting there eating some delicious chips and dip and sopa, not sopapillas yet, but uh, tortillas with cheese, and it was just amazingly good I got into a discussion about Scripture with the other, or with the two pastors. I wasn't a pastor yet. I was just the youth guy. Um, but with the two pastors, we started talking about Scripture, and the rest of the staff is kind of joining in. And then a guy who was not even close to our table, like four tables away, he asked us, Hey, are you talking about Scripture? And I was like, uh, Yeah, sure are. Uh, and so he came over to our table, and he asked us about a, a, a verse in the book of Job talking about the four corners of the earth, right? Um, and I thought, oh no, here we go. He's, he's going to be an atheist. He's going to use that one scripture to say that Christians are dumb or something like that. I was just preparing for the argument in my head. And so he goes, do you know what that proves? And I, I was getting ready for it. I was like, no, why don't, why don't you tell me? And then uh, he, he dropped the truth bomb on me. He said, it proves that the world is flat. And I was not expecting the conversation to go in this direction. And so I found myself in a strange position of trying to use science to argue with a guy about the Bible. Like normally, I think we, we think of Christians being on the other end of that spectrum, but you know, it didn't matter what I would say, right? I'd be like, well, I've been to Bolivia, and when I flew there, like I, I, could, I felt like it felt roundish, right? No, they just told you you were on a plane, but really, they tricked you. Like, you, you, that is not what happened. They, they simulated the whole experience. Like, what about, what about the Apollo missions, right? What about the pale blue dot? What about all of, you know, this scientific evidence? No, they faked it. Um, well, why, what about, you know, Magellan? He circumnavigated the globe. Like, why are we still believe what Magellan said? And I just couldn't understand him at all. What he was saying was so strange to me that it didn't make any sense. Like, when I think of the idea of a weird person, no offense to those of you that are flat earth believers out there, uh, you have to say that this is different than what everybody else believes, right? Like, and and so here's what happened. Uh, Both of the pastors were smart enough to turn their backs (laughs) and let me keep talking to them. And afterwards, I gave, when I was trying to give them a hard time for it, they're like, you're the one that's dumb enough to talk to him. Um, but 
we don't always know how to deal with weird things, right? Like, I was so flabbergasted by that. I wanted to dive in and figure out what was happening with this guy. Why would he believe that? And um, I never really got any good answers. I never found out, like, who benefits from this conspiracy of saying that the world is round. I never found out what scientific evidence uh, um, he was really saying that would support the idea of a flat earth. I, I didn't understand any of that thing. It just seemed so strange and so weird to me that I, I'd still, to this day, like, when I think of strange and weird, this guy comes up in my brain. I tell you that story because I think that the early church must have looked really weird to the rest of the world in its time. Like, they must have looked crazy. They must have, been look, they must have looked like these flat earth people do to me. Like, what they were doing is so strange and it's so different. When we read this passage from Acts, we see all sorts of just strange things happening. And I've read this passage a hundred times, right? Acts 2, 42 through 47. And uh, I've just whizzed by it most of the time. And I think most of the time when we're doing Bible readings, we just go straight past it. But do we really realize what's happening in this passage? Have we broken it down and asked ourselves, is this normal? I mean, let's just break it down just verse by verse. First it says that they're devoted to the apostles' teaching, Right? I think we as modern Christians, we get that. We're, we, we're devoted to the apostles' teaching, right? But think about this in the first century Jewish context, right? The apostles, these, these followers of Jesus, they're outsiders. These guys are the guys that everybody was like, eh, I don't know about them. These are, these are the people that have a dissenting opinion. These are the people that are saying that God was not only uh, there to save his people, but he came down in the flesh, in the person of Jesus Christ, and he died, and then he came back to life, and that that's the God that we're worshiping. Think about how strange that must have sounded to people. right? It would be strange to be devoted to the apostles of teaching, and yet these people were. It says they were de dedicated to fellowship, right? Community, true community. In a world where, where, just in the ancient world, like being truly committed to a community, usually that meant that you were committed to like a group of people or a nationality. I'm a Jewish person or I'm, I'm a Roman person or I'm a Greek person, Right? You might think of your national interests, or you might think of the interests of, like, your local town or village, but you wouldn't form some sort of community of just random people. That didn't make any sense. It was strange. It says they were dedicated to the breaking of bread. And I, I think, you know, we read that, we're like, oh, yeah, they were into communion. But it's so much more than that, right? Like, first of all, there is the ritual part of it. How strange does it sound to break bread and say, this is somebody's body, and to pour out some wine and to say, this is somebody's blood, and then to eat it and drink it. Like, it looks strange from the outside, right? It's weird. It's not normal. But, but more than that, like, when they broke bread together, it wasn't just a ritual. It wasn't just a religious thing. It wasn't just about eating bread and drinking wine and remembering Jesus. But they actually shared in real meals, right? Communion was a part of the meal. Anytime they got together, anytime they broke bread, they remembered Jesus. And that meal was different. That meal wasn't, it wasn't like a lot of the meals that we experience. Because, first of all, it was, it was a table of equals, right? The rich sat down with the poor, and they shared meals together. The tax collector and the prostitute sat down with the holy people, right? Everybody who was anybody feasted in this ancient culture. But usually the people who were nobodies, they were left out. They were left out out. They were not invited to these feasts, but this community of early Jesus followers, they, they open up the doors. Not only that, they say crazy things like, don't give preference to the rich person at the party, but the poor. Like, when they come in, everybody's equal at these meals. 
That must have looked strange. It must have looked so strange, especially in an extremely hierarchical society where everybody had a role and you didn't leave it. You stayed where you were. But the early community of Christians was different. They were weird. The next thing it says, it says that they were people who were dedicated to prayer. Now, I think as modern Christians, we can sometimes, again, just read over that. Like, yeah, we're Christians. We're supposed to pray. Right? No big deal. But think about this. Like, truly being a person who is known as being dedicated to prayer, like, it's more than just saying T's and P's. You've got my thoughts and prayers. Right? It's more than that. Like, it's truly believing that there's this ability of human beings because of what God has done through prayer that we can make an impact in the real world, that we can make an impact on spiritual things. Like, imagine a community of people that is just fervently in prayer all the time. Like, that seems weird to us, even as church people, right? I know that when I announced earlier that we were going to have a prayer meeting on Wednesday, that somebody out there was saying, well, what good is that going to do? Somebody out there was saying, well, that just, that's no big deal, right? Christians pray all the time. But no, we're going to make a spiritual impact on the world, right? We can't do that without prayer. Prayer is everything, And not only that, when these people pray, when these people are in community together, this passage says that they did signs and wonders that filled the people with awe. And that word awe could also be translated as fear. Like, these things that they're doing are so beyond the pale of normal that people don't know what to make of it. They're in awe, they're in fear, they're like, what is happening through this group of people? It's strange. Maybe the strangest one for us as 21st century Americans is the next one. It says they had everything in common. Now, when we read that phrase, we can, sometimes it can get lost in the translation. Like, they had everything in common. Like, oh, they all like the same sports teams. Or they were really into the color, you know, plaid. They liked plaid. You know, when we say they have, they, when we say in our, in our normal everyday speech, we have something in common, it means there's something that we both like, or there's something that we both do, or there, there's some sort of connection between us. But when Scripture says that they had everything in common, it means that they literally shared all of their stuff, right? That none of their possessions possessed them, but instead they used them for the good of God's people, now, I think of all the things that I've said today about uh, the power of prayer, this being devoted to Scripture, like the breaking of the bread. I think all of that seems like maybe if that didn't weird you out, that when I get to the part where I say we're supposed to share our possessions, some of you are like ready to click, turn off the screen, right? You're ready to leave. I'm sorry, I can't change Scripture. That's what it says. And it's something I struggle with. It says they sold their property and possessions to give to anyone in need. That when they ate together, they came together with glad and sincere hearts. I think that it's important that it says that they came together with glad and sincere hearts after it says they gave everything away. Imagine that. Imagine giving everything away and then being glad and thankful. It's weird, right? It's strange. It says they praised God and they enjoyed the favor of all the people. And then God added to their number daily those who were being saved. I mean, this is a weird community by ancient standards. No community in the world that we know of up until this point was like this. I mean, for most people, this wasn't even I, I, an idea of what a community could look like. Now, there were some groups in the ancient world, like the Stoics. 
They had ideas about utopian community. They had ideas about friendship that maybe one day might look like this. Like, this is kind of an ideal. This could happen maybe one day in a perfect society. But nobody actually thought it could be a reality. Nobody really thought this was a thing that was actually happening or that could happen. And yet, this community existed and this community changed the world. It's strange. It was strange then. But what about today? Does this community we read about in Acts, does it seem normal now? I'm going to guess that if we really think about it, it's not, right? I mean, this kind of community is still weird today. I mean, think about it. Like, somebody that really follows the apostles' teachings, like, we might not see them as weird in the church, but we also think of them maybe as, like, otherworldly or, like, they're doing something I can't do. That, that person's a saint because they actually follow the apostles' teachings. Or think about this fellowship idea, this idea of true community. Most of us don't really lean into that. Like, we would rather be individuals. Or breaking bread, right? Like, how many of us are, like, breaking our bread with homeless people on a regular basis? How many of us uh, don't care how terrible the rest of the world thinks that other person is that's sitting down and sharing a meal with us? What about prayer? How much time do we spend in prayer? I got to tell you guys, I'm a professional, licensed, trained pastor, and I don't spend enough time in prayer. Some of my prayers are less than a minute. That shames me, and that's not the way it should be. But I'm going to bet that my prayer life looks way better than some of you guys's even when it's at its lowest. Because we don't take prayer seriously. That's too strange, even for people in the church. And then the signs and wonders that filled people with awe, are we, I think we're just like, that's not even a thing. Let's pretend like that doesn't happen so we can just ignore it, right? Giving away our possessions, having everything in common, Whoa, uh, let's put some 20th century constructs on this and say, I do not believe in communism, right? I've heard so many arguments about, uh, you know, Jesus wasn't a communist or Jesus was a communist or whatever. Jesus wasn't promoting a political system. The early Jesus followers were just a community that took care of each other, that knew what that meant. They don't care about your 20th century construct of what sort of government works and doesn't work. They know what kind of community works. They ate together with sincere and glad hearts. Do we do that? How much of the community that you're a part of, how much of it expresses gladness? How many of those people are sincere in their love for each other? Or how many of them really just, they promote their agendas and uh, call it love? Are we praising God as often as we should? Are we enjoying the favor of the people because of the great love that we show? Or the great power and the great works that God is pouring out through us? Is God adding to the number daily in our community, of people who are being saved. I think if we're honest, we're going to say, if we look really hard at Acts 2, 42 through 47, we have to say that that kind of community seems weird to us. And then it might not even seem possible. I mean, is this kind of Christian community even possible for us today? Let's ask that question. Is it?
The book of Acts isn't just supposed to be a nice story for us to reflect on. It's not something that happened in the past that we're like, oh, what God was moving back then. Instead, it's supposed to be a blueprint of what the church is actually supposed to be like. Like, I, I know that's hard. Like, a lot of times we try to contextualize our way out of it. We'll say like, well, that might have worked in the ancient world, but we can't live like that today. Hmm? But God never makes that distinction. He never says that this form of community is supposed to stop and some other form of community is supposed to replace that. This is literally what we're supposed to do. This is literally what the church is supposed to look like. This is literally what Christian community is supposed to be. So how are we supposed to do this? I mean, it seems impossible, right? Well, it seems impossible for a really good reason. It is. It's impossible for us to do that. But yet God expects community to look like that. So is, is God giving us an unrealistic expectation? No. Because God gives us the person of the Holy Spirit. Anytime you read a passage of Scripture, it's important to read what comes before and what comes after, right? You have to know the context of the text that you're reading. And just a few verses before Acts 2, 42 through 47, in verse 38, it says this. It says, this is Peter giving a sermon to this crowd. He says, change your hearts and lives. Each of you must be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And then he says this, and we always ignore this as a modern church, but this is what it says. He says, then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For those of us who trust in Christ, we've been given the gift of the Holy Spirit. It dwells within us. The Spirit powers the change in our own lives. And in powers the life of Christian community. I think a lot of us, when we think of God's grace, we think of it as this operative thing, right? This thing that operates on us and comes from the outside. But it's also cooperative. God gives us his spirit, and we get to cooperate with that spirit every step of the way. We get to walk in step with God and do the things that God is calling us to do. And we could choose not to cooperate But when we do, when we do what God's called us to do, amazing things happen. When we operate with the Spirit as our guide and with the Spirit empowering us, we see miracles. But again, let's get real. When we start talking about the Holy Spirit in the church today, it makes us uncomfortable, right? A lot of us believe that the Holy Spirit exists, but then we pretend like the Spirit isn't active in our lives. Or like God hasn't empowered us to do the signs and wonders that the early church did. And that's a shame. When we think like that, we're denying ourselves a wonderful gift. So, you see, through the Spirit, God invites us into the Trinity itself. If Jesus' work on the cross restores our relationship with God the Father, then the Spirit empowers us and guides, guides us and strengthens that relationship. Every time I get up on Sunday morning, I say that our mission is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. But transformation of the world, the way God has called us to do it, requires us to be Spirit-filled people. It requires us to be weird. So my challenge is to ask for the Spirit. My challenge is to listen for the Spirit of God that dwells inside of you and to respond to that Spirit. My challenge is to read these scriptures and ask God's Spirit to guide you on how to live this sort of life, to operate with that kind of power, with that kind of love. So that when you're living in the Spirit, you can do small things with great love. So that your everyday actions 
can show people what Jesus is like. So that we can have the favor of the people. Because they see the great and mighty acts that God is doing with us. If we cooperate with that grace, if we open our hearts and minds and innermost being to God's spirit, then like the church in Acts, God will add to our number daily those who are being saved. But we can't do that by being normal. Some people believe in a flat earth. Other believe, others believe that the Spirit of God is living and active in their, our lives and empowering us to establish God's kingdom in the world. Both of these positions sound crazy, but one of them is actually true. Be weird. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. come now to the time where we will celebrate Holy Communion. So I was listening to Jonathan's sermon, and it reminded me that, you know, for the world, when we celebrate Holy Communion, it looks sort of weird. The body and the blood of Christ. But yet, by the very grace and the power of the Holy Spirit, we know in our hearts that these elements become really the body and blood of Christ for us. And it reminds us that his body and blood reside in us each and every day to give us strength and purpose to live in and live through. So join with me in our prayer of great thanksgiving as we celebrate this weird and holy meal together. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let's give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and a joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their ending hymn. Blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ Please bow with me in prayer. Almighty and powerful Holy Spirit, pour out your Spirit on us gathered here this day, virtually and in this place as well. Pour out your Spirit on these gifts of bread and wine, wherever they may be, 
and transform them for us into the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ and one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And now, with the confidence of children of God, let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Take of this holy meal together.
As we've partaken in this holy meal together, and now we prepare to leave, I ask that you would please sing with us as we sing song channels only, and as we prepare to be channels in which God moves and does marvelous and majestic and huge things in our world through seemingly small things in us. So would you please sing with us? How I praise Thee, precious Savior, that Thy love laid hold of me. Thou hast saved and cleansed and filled me, that I might Thy channel be. that thou shouldest fill me a clean vessel in thy hand with no power but as thou givest graciously with each command channels only blessed master but with all Before our benediction, uh, just a reminder, the Spirit is working around you and in you and through you, and the power of prayer is real. So please join us on Wednesday night at 8 p.m. for that service. Um, even if uh, you don't send us a prayer request, even if we don't know you're praying with us, God knows, and that prayer is important. So please hear this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you and pour his spirit out on you so that you may be stranger than the times that we live in. Amen. Amen.